Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Mork, board certified orthopedic surgeon, endoscopic spine specialist over the past 14 years. Today, I'd like to just talk about an article I saw recently in one of our trade journals uh, talking about the use of epidural steroids for treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis. Well, it was very interesting, uh, the article, and I'm going to talk about that in a PowerPoint a little bit later, but let me just first review spinal stenosis, which is a narrowing of the hollow tubes or the hollow canals that the nerves, spinal cord and nerves, have to pass through. Think about stenosis like perhaps some calcification of your water pipes where there's deposits of calcium on the inside of the pipes taking up valuable space where the water in that case would have gone or in the case of the spine where the nerves actually pass through. All right. And then let's talk about an epidural steroid injection. Now, you probably heard about those recently with the uh, uh, fungal infections, but let's just review what an epidural steroid injection is. And I'm going to show you first on a model. If we take a spine like this, and we see that the vertebrae and the discs are in the front, the spinous processes are in the back, if we look in the center, we can see the spinal cord going down the center. So the spinal cord actually goes down the center of it. That is the spinal cord and the space around it is the epidural space. If I look at my picture that I've drawn for us, so in this particular point of view, what we can see is the model itself here on the picture I've drawn, this would be the disc or the vertebrae, and this would be the little bump on the back in which you, if you got a massage, this would be what someone's thumb might be on. And the hollow space here, the yellow is where the spinal cord or the cauda equina goes. And remember that there's a potential space between the nerve spinal cord and the actual uh, the cylinder of the spinal canal. Now remember that this is going to be smaller in a case where there's spinal stenosis and there will actually be an indentation in the nerve. That's the final effect of the stenosis on it. In this case, the needle, you can see, is going to go in to the actual space, not the, not the spinal cord or the cauda equina, but the space between the two. And with fluoroscopic x-ray, you have steroid that's injected into that particular area. That will actually bathe the contents of the spinal canal in steroid, which moves, it can move up and down from where it's injected. This is one place it can be injected from. Remember, it can also be injected from the side, and that would be what they call a transforaminal epidural steroid. So that's how the steroid is injected into the space between the spinal cord and the actual cylinder edges of the spinal canal, so to speak. All right, so now we'll go to a PowerPoint uh, display uh, which demonstrate the pluses and minuses of an epidural steroid injection, or ESI, for the treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis. It was a nice uh, article written by two doctors uh, uh, from two different universities saying giving the pluses and giving the minuses for the use of epidural steroids in spinal stenosis. So here we go. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the use of epidural steroids to treat lumbar spinal stenosis. There's a great article in the most recent uh, uh, paper for the uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, uh, kind of their monthly paper. In this article, there was a point counterpoint type of argument for the use of epidural steroids in the treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis. Dr. Bobby Kalantar of Georgetown University first noted in the article that it was statistically significant to benefit from surgery. So he noted that at, you know, as a first thing off, that lumbar epidural steroids are not to, to try to replace surgery. Surgery is beneficial on a statistical basis. And the epidural steroid is, of course, non-surgical treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis. One thing that Dr. Kalantar noted, and which I think is very important, is the natural history of lumbar spinal stenosis for people. 
and he n- noted a paper in which untreated patients were followed for 49 months, you know, about a little over four years. And during that period of time for the untreated population of the study, 70% of the people were unchanged. They didn't have any change. 15% got better, 15% got worse, all for no particular reason. So the natural history of lumbar spinal stenosis is sort of stable, 70% unchanged, but also could have people that got better and people who got worse for no particular reason. So that's the natural history of the disease. What observations uh, did Dr. Kalantar make when he was uh, reviewing the articles? Well, number one, that treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis worked better if treated within the first 12 months of symptom onset. And this was true whether the treatment was surgical or non-surgical. So I think that this is an important point of his analysis. The other thing that he noted was how the epidurals were administered. So there's two ways, as I showed in the, uh, in the beginning, and that's how to inject uh, the steroids, you know, whether into the central canal or transferaminally uh, into the canal. And the study demonstrated that after a transferaminal uh, injection of epidural steroid, that 75% of the people got 50% reduction in pain, 64% of the people got improved walking tolerance, and 57% got improved standing tolerance. And these were all noted at one year after the injections. So you can have some improvements from the epidural steroid injections, and I think that particularly uh, if it's done early after the onset of symptoms. On the other side, or the, the counterpoint, Uh, was uh, taken by Dr. Kristen Radcliffe from Jefferson Medical College and noting that there was no role for epidural steroids in the treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis and for a few different reasons. One, stenosis is not really inflammatory and therefore why should cortisone, which is an anti-inflammatory, a very powerful one, work at all? Uh, Number two, cited some... uh, that the fact that other joints in the body, just say, just say for example, the knees or hips, other weight-bearing joints in particular, could be adversely affected uh, by the uh, injection of steroids. And also that the uh, evidence for utilizing steroids for treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis that was symptomatic was relatively thin. Well, what observations were made by Dr. Radcliffe? First little piece here, sport subgroup, that's Spine Patient Outcome Research Trial, noted that there was less improvement after an epidural steroid than with nothing at all. So that subgroup was found in a larger study and the study was not directed at or trying to answer that question. It was merely an observation uh, within a larger study group. Uh, Number two, just take in mind that when we looked on the last set of slides that improvements after a cortisone injection may have occurred anyway. Remember 15% of the people who had no treatment at all, had improvement over a four-year period of time. Um, Number three was minor complications occurred about 11% of the time, which is, you know, it's significant. I don't think the complications except for a couple times and more recently some very catastrophic complications uh, as a result of a manufacturing defect with fungus, you know, in the actual steroid preparation themselves uh, really contributed to uh, fungal meningitis, which is really uh, a bad complication, but it's one that would not really created by the epidural steroid by the physician, but really uh, as a uh, result of a poor mixture, contaminated mixture. Uh, The other thing that's noted was the fact that the injection or use of epidural steroids didn't really reduce the surgery incidence or opioids And to some extent, makes some sense because only people who are sufficiently symptomatic would really consider getting epidural steroids in the first place. Mild cases or people with mild symptoms probably wouldn't even be thinking of it too much. Well, what can be said? What conclusions uh, can, can I come up with after looking at this article? First of all, I think that there are some uh, minor complications Uh, with an epidural steroid, but I think it's relatively safe with the exception of that recent contaminated batch of steroids uh, from Massachusetts, uh, which is really rare and almost unheard of. I think that 
it's probably best to treat symptomatic lumbar spinal stenosis in the first year. In other words, when you first get the symptoms, uh, whether you're going to opt for treating surgically or non-surgically with an epidural, initiate treatment sooner than later. I think that also uh, a lumbar epidural steroid may be a stronger consideration for a patient who is unable or unwilling to undergo surgery. For example, someone who's got some significant medical problems uh, may benefit from an epidural steroid if they're unable to undergo surgery. Um, one thing that was pointed out was that steroid may have some uh, uh, adverse effects on unrelated joints. Uh, difficult probably to establish, but certainly a possibility. And last is to really note the natural history of lumbar stenosis, which shows stable symptoms for 70% of the people over a four-year period of time, but for the uh, other 30%, 15% got worse and 15% got better, and that was without any treatment at all. So I hope you gave you some ideas for pluses and minuses why you might or might not consider an epidural steroid for treatment of stenosis, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. Listen, thanks very much. Visit me at drtonymart.com or give me a call at the office and keep an eye out for more videos. Thanks a lot.